Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good day, uh, post-holiday greetings. Uh, this is the first of the year, uh, 2017. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD for the Preventive Medicine Center. And if you have any questions about this program, uh, please uh, send your questions to our website uh, where the questions will get to me, uh, www.thepmc, the Preventive Medicine Center, .org. And uh, if you just want to call, the uh, telephone number is 860-549-3444. Well, I hope everybody had a wonderful holiday. Uh, it certainly is interesting times that we live in, not that we don't always live in interesting times. Uh, I want to start off with a couple of medical issues. Um, if a patient goes to the emergency room complaining of chest pain, and their EKG is nonspecific, but their risks are in other words, we're not talking about an 18-year-old athlete who suddenly gets chest pain, uh, probably on the basis of who knows what, but likely anxiety, uh, hurt his ribs, uh, something benign. But we're talking about uh, a 52-year-old, uh, slightly overweight a uh, man who had a history of smoking some years back and has a little bit, quote, elevated, quote, cholesterol, comes in with chest pain. What is the testing that should be done? Well, the way things are done now is they draw a particular blood test called the troponin, T-R-O-P-O-N-I-N. Uh, there are two versions of that, but that's not important. Each hospital has their own levels. And if that troponin is elevated, then uh, the patient uh, almost always gets admitted to the hospital uh, for evaluation. But what if that troponin value comes back normal? Then how do you decide what to do? Abnormal would mean the patient probably had at least a small heart attack, and normal means the patient may be about to have a heart attack, and you don't want to miss that diagnosis. The traditional uh, plan is to admit the patient for what's called a short stay, draw further blood tests, and then in the morning do either a nuclear or echo stress test. By the way, I think uh, really because of the high level of radiation, nuclear stress tests should stop being done directly from the emergency room and echo stress tests should be done. Now, that's not an all or none statement. There are some times when an echo stress test simply cannot be done, but there are almost no circumstances when a nuclear stress test can be done. But I'm sort of against both of those because what I want in the emergency room is the patient to be sent directly to radiology for a CT angiogram. CT angiogram, that's a CAT scan. A CAT scan angiogram, and yes, there is radiation involved, and no, I don't like that, but sometimes you have to bite the bullet and do what you have to do. Um, the article that I'm holding here that was the trigger for this discussion was an article about doing CT angiograms on asymptomatic diabetic patients who've had their diabetes for quite a while. Uh, I still tend to go 
the direction of echo stress test, but I'm moving more and more towards this CT angiogram in diabetics of more than 10 years duration, uh, whether they're having symptoms or not. And the reason is diabetics don't always have symptoms for their heart attack. Uh, their nerves have been affected, poisoned by their high sugar, and as a result, their histories may not be, I don't want to use the word reliable, but that's the word I'm going to use. Uh, their histories may not be accurate. Their histories may not be telling. Uh, their histories, and the reason is, as I already just said, the nerves have already been affected by the diabetes. Everybody's heard of diabetic neuropathy, uh, that painful sensation in the feet for which gabapentin uh, is often prescribed. There are other treatments for that, including uh, injected B12, uh, high-dose alpha-lipoic acid, et cetera, et cetera. And if anybody's interested in that, uh, we can discuss that at some time. So um, I would... Uh, like to promote the idea of CT angiograms in patients, particularly in the emergency room. Now, um, the benefit of that is the patient gets a diagnosis and then is either admitted or sent home, and there's no waiting around. I've done that several times. Interestingly, even this test can be misinterpreted a little bit, uh, as all tests are imperfect in medicine. Nothing is 100% in medicine. Now, um, the next thing that I want to talk about that I uh, have written down on this sheet of paper is called PAE. Uh, as men know, as they get older, they start waking up during the night uh, to go to the bathroom to void. And also, there is little hesitation. Uh, as they, This is a discussion for men. Uh, there is little hesitation uh, to get started. That's called hesitancy. And then uh, the stream is not as strong as it used to be, uh, so on and so on. There's this whole uh, uh, conglomerate of what constitutes the signs and symptoms of an, uh, an enlarging prostate around the ability to pee. The tube that comes out from the bladder uh, goes through this prostate, and that prostate is sort of squeezing down on it. Well, um, the traditional treatment for that has been what's called a TURP, transurethral resection of the prostate, T-U-R-P. And um, uh, that's not a tiny procedure, but on the other hand, like so many things, a couple of months after you've done it, you're pretty much over it. It does change some things uh, uh, in a man after that but uh, they are not uh, usually a huge problem. They're a bit of a problem, but they're not a huge problem. There is a new technique which has been developed at Hartford Hospital, uh, and that is they inject little tiny plastic balls through the arteries into the prostate to shut down the blood supply of the prostate. Well, what happens if you shut down the blood supply of the heart prostate? It, uh, so to put it in quote, it dies. And what happens when it dies? It shrinks down. So, and it doesn't shrink down further to compress. It shrinks down and opens up, allowing that stream of urine to get out easier. And so several people I know have had this procedure at Hartford Hospital, which is done by Mike Hallisey, a very talented uh, interventional radiologist. St. Francis is not yet doing it. UConn is not yet doing it. I think they're doing it at Yale. But uh, in any case, uh, that's just a uh, hat tip to, uh, that's not the right word. What's the right word, will you? Uh, what's the right word? Do you know what the right word is when you say hat tip or something? Tip your hat? No, it, uh, when you give credit to somebody else oh, um, or a shout out. Maybe it is hat tip. I don't know. Uh, anyhow, um, uh, so uh, I know Mike Hallisey and a uh, talented guy to consider prostatic artery embolization, P-A-E, prostatic artery embolization. Now, I remember when I first heard about this was in women who had large fibroids, and these fibroids depend upon blood so supply, as does almost everything in the human body. And uh, as a result, um, they used to inject these little tiny plastic balls into um, 
these fibroids and then they would shrink down. Now, some could be dealt with that way and some could not be dealt with that way. And the same thing for the prostates, but over 95% of prostates can be dealt with by this prostatic artery embolization. And I would presume the same was, was and is true for uterine embolization. Well, boy, that took up a lot of time. Okay, now what's next here? Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Uh, that's a very popular term. I forget who it was on TV who had this big tummy and uh, it sort of happened suddenly. I don't remember whether he gained any weight or not, um, which is an item we could talk about further. Uh, cook veg berries, cook vegetables, vegetable soup and beans if you want to lose weight. Uh, other than that, uh, you're going to have a hard time and what's more, it's not going to be as healthy. The high protein diets are more satisfying than berries, cooked vegetables, vegetable soup and beans for weight loss. But on the other hand, they're not as healthy and uh, they have downsides affecting the kidneys and the bones. But regardless, uh, uh, I sort of say any way you can get the weight off is a good one. Now, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. Why would one have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Okay. Uh, my usual jog to the side, uh, changing the subject and keeping it the same. Uh, motivational, in, uh, motivational interviewing, that's a new phrase. Uh, I love the phrase patient-centered. I've got to say, what the hell do people think has been going on forever if you were a caring physician? Of course it was patient-centered, but no, 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 that's a new Hollywood Madison Avenue term that now we're into patient-centered uh, medicine and we're into precision medicine. Uh, the precision medicine concept is almost a joke, but not really. Everybody thinks it's such a big deal. It's, it is the continuing evolution of where we have been going all along, using the most recent technology to identify what constitutes the proper treatment for the proper patient. And uh, this has been an evolutionary process, but suddenly these Madison Avenue terms come along like patient-centered, uh, uh, it's beyond me, and precision medicine. All right, small intestine, uh, so anyhow, motivational interviewing. Motivation interviewing is uh, sort of what do you see, uh, this is the doctor now, talking to the patient, what do you see as the problem? And then of course you're supposed to wait in the while they, and then what do you want to do about it? Well, of course, if you practice medicine correctly, you don't tell patients what to do. I've always used the concept of invitation to consider. And in its harsher terms, take it or leave it. Uh, but you see, you work with the patient. It isn't take it or leave it like, here's the treatment, do it. It's like, here's what I think is the proper treatment. What do you want to do? You're going to decide. That's the take it or leave it part. Uh, you're going to decide what we are going to do together. And of course, that's very patient-centered uh, care, but uh, as far as I know, that's where ph all physicians have almost always been. Now there is the old uh, image of the surgeon who comes in and says, tomorrow we're going to remove uh, discs three, four, and five. Um, I'll see you in the operating room and out the door. That did happen but not really very often. Physicians actually like to talk a lot like me, and so they like to explain things to patients. And so there was always an explanation. I must admit, because of the legal environment, uh, the explanation has gotten a little bit longer, but to no real avail, uh, uh, I always said risk of serious body harm or death uh, if you want to do this procedure, there isn't any medical procedure that is good for patients. They're all bad. They're just less bad than leaving the condition untreated, uh, undiagnosed, and whatever. Uh, and again, that's not on any one patient. That is the patients as a group. Uh, so what physicians and patients 
have to think about is, in your particular case, is it worthwhile to proceed with this or not? Would you, what do you want? And then what would you like to do? And um, when I talk, which I'm uh, being scheduled to talk at a corporation, a large corporation uh, fairly soon, um, I always start off uh, in the very beginning of my talk saying, what do you want with the parenthetical conclusions uh, to have happened to you? What do you want to have happen to you? And the answer is, if you don't want bad things to happen, there are rules. And it's not like I'm perfect, and it's not like I'm throwing a stone. It's like each one of us has to make up our mind what chances we're willing to take. And sometimes we're bad at doing that. We're tempted, and we are surrounded by a gazillion people pulling, people forces pulling us in the wrong direction, advertising on TV, mom needs a break today. Uh, uh, what did I see that uh, now they have... Uh, fried nuggets uh, at uh, McDonald's. You don't need the nuggets. And you don't need them fried. But regardless, uh, that's no different than what you get at Burger King or Sergeant Pepperoni or whatever. Um, a little detour here. I brought in my Dunkin' Donut uh, bill. I went there this morning and got a uh, medium uh, dark roast coffee. I actually think their dark roast coffee is pretty good. At St. Francis Hospital upstairs in the cafeteria, they also have a dark roast. Uh, it's called Colombian Supremo Dark Roast. And uh, it's very strong, rich taste. By the way, public, please quit putting in milk. I mean, use almond milk. And I think drinking iced coffee is not really a smart idea. And drinking real hot coffee is also not a smart idea. It should be a little bit cooled off uh, from maximally hot. And ice is just a bad idea. And then putting in the sugar and the creamer, that is a cosmically bad idea and very high calorie. So uh, my suggestion is if you have your one cup of coffee a day, small, maybe medium, uh, no, no lightener except maybe almond milk if you want, and uh, no sweetener like sugar. Back to small intestinal bowel overgrowth. Why does this condition happen? And backing up to the motivational interviewing, what do you want? If you want your health, there's a price. And I don't mean money price. I mean there's a behavioral price. There are things you can do, and there are things you cannot do. And if you choose to go the route of medicine, and I say all drugs are poison, including the ones I prescribe, including vitamins, minerals, herbs, and supplements, be well, use as few as possible. Once again, getting off track, I don't recommend taking supplements any more than five days a week. I personally believe the body needs a break. And just parenthetically, throwing in a vitamin D discussion, if you don't have kidney disease, I think virtually everyone needs 5,000 units, not 1,000, not 2,000, but 5,000 units of vitamin D five days a week. And the proper blood level to see if you've gotten it the right place is a blood level of 50 to 66 nanograms. There's also nanomoles. You don't, I'm not talking nanomoles. I'm talking nanograms, tiny little grams, nanograms. Uh, 50 to 60, uh, uh, 50 to 66 nanograms per milliliter of 25 hydroxy vitamin D3. All you have to remember is 50 plus and 25 D3 blood level. So anyhow, getting back to the why does this happen? Uh, forgive me for being me. Um, this, it, everything that happens to the body Pretty much, I said everything and then I said pretty much, pretty much everything that happens to the body, I have 10 minutes left, okay. Pretty much everything that happens to the human body is because we make it happen. And small intestinal bowel overgrowth is just another one of those conditions which occurs because imagine yourself the intestines and the intestines are sitting there and there's this stuff coming down. If it's brown rice, vegetables, beans, fruit, nuts, and seeds, miso soup, and um, 
miso soup. Yeah. Uh, I made uh, this miso soup yesterday, uh, these packets. Uh, they're okay. Uh, they're freeze-dried. This one was way too salty. You don't want to use a whole packet of that. Sodium content on this one was 30%. You should not exceed 12% in any one serving from any one container. So for this to be acceptable, this one packet should uh, be for three people. That would be 10% sodium per serving per container. And don't go around looking at the milligrams because the smaller numbers are easier to grasp. 12% or less per serving, per container, per meal, per day. All right, so anyhow, so it should be miso soup and sauerkraut, live uh, sauerkraut. Uh, you can get that at Whole Foods. Um, I don't know whether Bubby's uh, is or Bubby's is or is not live sauerkraut, but um, uh, so to get the right bacteria in your bowel so that you don't have small intestinal bowel overgrowth, you have to have the correct input. Uh, once again, forgive me for the language, garbage in, garbage out. Uh, you get conditions if you have the wrong input. If you're eating donuts and bagels and uh, standard chicken and so on, instead of, so to speak, quinoa, millet, brown rice, hulled barley, um, uh, and then vegetables except potatoes, and then beans, and then a little bit of fruit, nuts, and seeds uh, with wild-caught fish or free-range or free-range chicken or cage-free eggs or bison, uh, not more than two to three times a week. Add all of those animal proteins together. If your diet is essentially vegan, vegetarian, uh, 18 to 19 meals a week with animal protein two to three times a week. A week, not a day, a week. Um, then you're not going to get small intestinal bowel overgrowth or cancer of the colon or high cholesterol or diabetes, et cetera, et cetera. We make these diseases happen. Remember the motivational interesting, uh, interviewing. What is it that you want and what do you want to do? Uh, it's, and what you want to do has... <laughs> should be in the realm of reality so that conditions don't happen. I want to smoke a cigarette. No, that's not exactly the right or healthy answer. I want to have a couple lines of cocaine. No, I want to have a steak. I want to have Kentucky Fried Chicken. Hey, do what you want to do, but there is an end result. And the end result is conditions like small intestinal bowel overgrowth uh, or diverticulitis or appendicitis or cancer of the colon or high cholesterol or open heart surgery or angioplasty or whatever. So don't make things happen. It is your choice. What I say is an invitation to consider, uh, which has a tough, sort of nasty translation of take it or leave it. I'm here to be a help. I'm not here to be a critic. All right, anyhow, last night's Golden Globes. Um, uh, interesting. Women really wore some interesting dresses. The men look nice. Uh, Mel Gibson has lost his Australian accent. He speaks American like the rest of us. Uh, there was some other famous actor, uh, Gary Oldman, who I think is British. He lost his British accent and had to be taught how to speak British again. Uh, but I love Gary Oldman and I love G Mel Gibson's movies and acting, but um, he's got a checkered background that makes me worry about whether or not I like him per se. Now to Meryl Streep. Meryl Streep, I think, chose the wrong venue to make her statement. Uh, that was neither the time nor the place uh, to have those remarks. Uh, because uh, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And uh, while she is an outstanding actress, five minutes, uh, she is an outstanding actress. Uh, what she said was at least calm. I give her credit for that. But once again, it was inappropriate. Uh, you might say, well, what constitutes appropriate whatever? And look at all those people who supported her. Uh, idiots are everywhere. And uh, they should have known better, and she should not have done that. And I think the audience was, in a certain sense, forced to do that. And by the way, I say that as a thoroughbred Democrat. 
I'm a registered Democrat. I just want things to be even-handed. Trump has his foibles, but we needn't uh, be so persistently disparaging about him. Uh, he can say exactly the same thing that uh, uh, Barack Obama said. I won. Barack Obama tossed that out one time uh, when he was asked why he was doing it. He said, I won. Well, Trump won. And so you have to give the man the benefit of the doubt. And uh, uh, that Jeff Sessions, who's going to be, I guess, attorney general, said something in 1986. <laughs> give me a break. 1986? We're talking 32 years ago. I don't care what word he used, and you know what word he used back then. We're all different people some, uh, I said 36, 32 years later, 86, 30 years later. Finally, my math is correct. Um, so um, uh, the point being is that uh, give Trump uh, the option to get his team together and to get going, and the Democrats are making a terrible mistake. This is exactly what they accuse the Republicans of. So, uh, you know, you want to play that game, uh, under Barack Obama, 1,000 elected Democratic officials lost their seats. There are now more governorships, uh, combined House and Senate, uh, that are completely Republican in the, uh, across the nation than since the 1920s or 1940s, regardless, a very long time ago. And, and Obama said it himself, this election is a, um, how did he say it? This election represents uh, continuing his policies was the concept. His policies were rejected. And you can say, no, wait a minute, the popular vote, the popular vote. He won two major states, not the rest of the nation. Uh, uh, Hillary Clinton won two major states, not the rest of the, the nation. He won California, won New York. And if you take a look at the map of who voted, who voted for Clinton and who voted for uh, Trump, uh, it's massively across the United States, and fair and square he won. This was the fifth time someone who did not win the popular vote won the presidency itself. So my point is that we have two minutes. My point is that uh, uh, Meryl Streep is a wonderful actress, which Trump tweeted today that she wasn't, which is wrong. Uh, Trump is occasionally silly, uh, and um, it's often hard to separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, but uh, that goes for most politicians, including our previous president, who says one thing, and then something else turns out to be the case. So uh, anyhow, uh, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, quickly, um, let's see, silent dangers of high uric acid. Oh. Motivational interviewing, I wrote it down here. What are your goals? What do you want to do? Well, I was close. Uh, silent uh, high uric acid. Uh, there is a natural product called Terminalia, and then there are standard prescription items. One minute. Amla, an ancient berry. Amla, you know, we have berry of the month. We have goji, we have blueberries, we have this. Uh, what are some of the other hot berries? Well, anyhow, now it's Amla, A-M-L-A. -A. That's the Indian gooseberry. And remember my position on supplements, not more than five days a week. Fast, soothing, digestive relief. Esophagard and Esophacool from Life Extension Foundation are not that expensive, but are very good products, and I do recommend them. Um, Hartford Hospital and Prostatic Artery Embolization, good day and God bless you all. Uh, talk to you soon, hopefully. Uh, please let me know what you think. H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center.